Okay, so hello and welcome to the uh, Oxford Discrete Maths and Probability Seminar. Um, I'm Alex Scott, organising this with uh, Christina Goldschmidt. Um, a couple of bits of housekeeping before we get going. So, uh, so at the moment we have everybody muted um, so that you'll be able to hear everything going on. Um, if you have questions or uh, want to discuss anything during the um, during the seminar, uh, you can do so in the Zoom chat, um, which is normally quite active. Uh, you can also uh, raise hands. So in the in the bottom bar, uh, there's a way of doing that. Um, we're recording the talk, uh, so for GDPR reasons, I, I we should let you know that. Um, we encourage people, uh, if you're comfortable doing so, to leave on video and uh, use your real name. But if you prefer, you can also leave your video off, um, not include your name and so forth. Um, for other announcements, so there's a, a mailing list. Please do subscribe to the mailing list if you'd like to get the announcements. Zoom links will get propagated there as well. Um, and we, uh, Christine and I both welcome any suggestions that you want to make, please, uh, please email both of us with, with suggestions. Okay, so having said that, let me um, hand over to Christina, who's going to introduce the speaker. Hi, so I'm just going to stop sharing my screen so that Luigi can um, share his instead. Um, and while he does that, um, let me just say that it's an enormous pleasure to welcome Luigi Adario Berry, who's joining us um, from Montreal. Um, and uh, he's going to talk to us about hipster random walks and their ilk. And Luigi, take it away whenever you're ready. I just make sure I'm unmuted. Can everyone hear me? Can anyone hear me? I got some thumbs up, so that's great. Um, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, this is my first time giving such a virtual talk. It's a uh, really interesting to be speaking with people on two or three or four continents and several time zones all at once. Uh, and maybe most importantly, with a variety of backgrounds, this is discrete mass and probability. So I'll try to keep the subject accessible to both crowds. Um, before I start, um, I need to say I would uh, get in serious trouble with my kids if I didn't uh, say hello to all of uh, our friend mathematicians uh, who are tuned in. Um, so uh, a big hello from Solomon and Francesca to many of you. Right, so um, I'll stop a few times during the talk to take questions um, via chat. Uh, so if, there's, if there are things that are unclear, um, please try to um, formulate them um, in text and I'll do my best to respond. Um, and last, uh, before I get going, um, this is joint work with uh, Hannah Cairns, who's a finishing graduate student with Lionel Levina Cornell, Luke DeVroy, my colleague at McGill, and Céline Carriou and Rivka Mitchell, who are master's students with me at McGill as well. Right. Um, so this work stemmed from a attempt to understand uh, a paper um, by Tuka Aufinger and Dylan Cable, and I'll get to that a little later, um, but it turned out to um, reveal to us some connections between um, distributional limit theorems for PDEs and uh, um, numerical analysis, particularly approximation schemes um, uh, for um, numerical, so numerical approximation schemes for PDEs. I want to start by um, uh, explaining um, that connection in a fairly straightforward way. So this is, um, um, let me say, using um, probability to prove theorems in numerical analysis, or a theorem. Uh, So what I, what I really mean by this is um, that we're going to use facts from probability to see that some discrete approximation to a PDE is a good, is a good way to approximate the PDE numerically. And um, uh, so for this example, I just want to uh, 
think about one of the most fundamental PDEs, the heat equation. Uh, so ut is constant uxx. Right, so my notation um, here, this is some function um, from uh, space and time uh, into the real line. And I write ut for the partial of u with respect to t, ux for the partial of u with respect to with respect to x. Okay. Um, so I'm thinking of this um, as describing the diffusion of a particle um, in one dimensional space. And um, uh, so the fundamental solution of this uh, PD is given by uxt is one over root c times two pi t e to the minus x squared over two ct. Okay, and this is, uh, so this is um, describing the density of a, of a Brownian motion. So that's our diffusing particle. Right, so, um, so what does it mean to be a fundamental solution? Uh, so that means that this uh, solves the initial value problem So the PDE is the one we wrote just above. Um, ut is constant uxx. Um, and then the uh, time zero uh, condition is just a Dirac delta at zero. So this is um, formally um, saying, uh, so we're thinking of this as a density, so it's sort of infinite density at the point zero and zero density anywhere else, <clears throat> right? And so this phrase, um, fundamental solution, just means um, uh, from this Dirac initial condition. Okay, and, and um, of course, so formally, the, um, such a function, uh, or strictly speaking, such a function doesn't have a, um, a derivative or anything, but if you sort of take a time to zero limit, you'd recover, a, the, the densities become steeper and steeper around zero, and you'd recover a sort of direct function. Okay, so, um, so that's, um, if you've seen PDEs before, you've seen this PDE, um, and uh, it's a very natural question of how you would simulate this uh, in a computer. Right, so um, let me write it down again. Right, well, I mean, the sort of, if you just follow your nose, the first thing that you're um, likely going to think of is to discretize. Um, so that is to say, we'll fix some small uh, positive um, values, delta t and delta x, um, and then approximate the partial derivatives by sort of um, the, the ratios that um, uh, converge to those derivatives. So ut, um, so this is ddt uh, utx, we would approximate is u t plus delta t x minus u t x over, uh, over delta t. I should say these are positive. Um, and um, so this is, uh, so this is, um, we're approximating the derivative by moving forward in time. So you can think of having sort of figured out your approximate values, your approximation of the heat equation at some time t, and you're looking to, uh, to move that forward to a time t plus uh, dt um, using uh, this approximate derivative. And then you, for uxx, um, the problem is sort of uh, spatially, um, uh, so space, uh, we want, uh, it's spatially symmetric in a way it isn't temporally symmetric. Uh, so it's more natural to, uh, 
approximate the derivative uh, in a symmetric way. So say a half um, ut x plus delta x minus uh, ut x minus delta x. Um, so let me actually write this as, um, uh, so we're, um, we've moved a delta x in either direction around x, so we better divide by two delta x for our approximation. Um, and now we've only taken one derivative, so if this inner thing, if we, if we call that vtx, then uh, we'd better um, now uh, approximate uh, uh, this as vt x, just the same thing we did before, vtx plus delta x, uh, vt x minus delta x, uh, all on two delta x, and substituting back in our um, expression for v, that gives us, um, so uh, c times, then we get a quarter, um, ut x plus two delta x minus twice uh, ut x plus ut x minus two delta x. Uh, and now all on delta x squared. Okay, um, so this is, um, this is a perfectly reasonable way to discretize uh, the heat equation. Okay, this is called, a, um, yeah, so as a finite difference equation, this, this sort of a scheme um, and a, a method of approximation is called um, uh, forward in time, central in space. Okay, um, or FTCS. And I mean, you can, so you can find it under that name in a numerical analysis textbook. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's really the sort of the first thing you could try. Okay, um, now, um, if we wanted, uh, so to uh, see the probabilistic connection, uh, I want to uh, take uh, delta t to be um, delta x squared over c, right? So I'm setting um, I'm setting this equal to this. Okay, and um, and then uh, this. So the identity given by the heat equation applied at this to this sort of approximate, this this um, discrete approximation, um, becomes uh, a sort of uh, discrete difference equation, which is uh, so. U K naught will take um, our initial condition. Um, uh, the indicator that k is zero, and then uh, the the update. So this is our dt on the left. One time step is a quarter uh, u k plus two n minus twice u k n plus u k minus two n. Okay, and here. Uh, so this is um, uh, for, I guess, n positive and any k and z. So n is time, k is space, right? And uh, this might look familiar to you again, but let me uh, make the probability um, connection perfectly clear now. Um, this is just, uh, this recurrence uh, gives the values the probability that um, Sn equals K um, for Sn, a symmetric simple random walk. Okay, um, and uh, the, just to quickly see this, right, if we, um, if we move the, this term over to the right here, um, uh, this is giving us, so, um, this gives us, um, so UK, uh, N plus one, I guess this should be S, um, 
uh, 2n, in fact. So there's, I've somehow, um, I've somehow moved two times, uh, two times steps at once. Um, so, uh, uh, so ukn plus one is then um, a quarter of uk plus two n plus two ukn plus u k minus two n. Okay, and um, uh, so here um, you can see uh, sort of inductively if at time uh, we're saying if it uh, the, the ways you could end up at position k at time n plus one well maybe you were you were two steps to the right at time n and you made two steps to the left that has probability a quarter or you made what you you were already at position k and you made one step to the right and one to the left or you were at k minus two and you made one step to the right okay so this is um this should all feel quite uh sort of elementary um and uh, maybe i should just say um up here started from zero. So our, our initial condition indicator k is zero here corresponds to uh, starting on a random walk from zero. Okay. Um, so now um, uh, the local central limit theorem tells us that um, so this so the central limit theorem tells us that the distribution of s to n is approximately a Gaussian after rescaling by uh, a term of order squared n. Um, the local central limit theorem tells us that the density for a of a Gaussian is even a good approximation to these local probabilities to the to the um, probability mass function. So um, it tells us that um, ux root n, n divided by um, root 2 pi 2n uh, e to the minus x squared on, um, uh, I guess, twice 2n um, is converging uh, to 1 as n tends to infinity uniformly on compax. Okay, and this expression down here is precisely of the form uxt um, for uh, an appropriate solution of our of our heat equation up here. Okay, so um, so that that means that the local central limit theorem is actually telling us a fact about the quality of this. Um, this numerical approximation to the PDE. Um, and uh, so this would typically be phrased in a sort of numerical analysis setting in terms of a space-time convergence. So um, we could write it like this. Uh, let's, um, let's define a approximation of the PDE now. Um, whoops, my index is in the wrong order. Um, uh, so I'll write M times this uh, discrete approximation at mx um, and uh, c m squared t over 2. Okay, this over 2 is due to the, the um, parity issue we just saw up here. Um, and uh, so then um of xt uh, converges to u of x t uh, uniformly uncompact in uh, r cross zero infinity. Okay, so we've wrapped up the information <coughs> in our discrete approximation into a sort of space-time field of values. And if you like, um, it's, uh, I'm gonna try to grab part of a uh, drawing that I'll use later. Um, just to emphasize, so this is the sort of picture we have a different spatial and temporal scaling, right? The um, the um, the sort of spatial mesh here is a one over m, and the temporal mesh is one over m squared because of the quadratic scaling in the heat equation. Okay, um, so uh, so this is a 
this is a, a just a simple example of how one could use um, uh, probability to prove something about quality of approximation in numerical analysis. Um, I'm going to show you um, in the remainder of the talk, um, if we get there, uh, an example of how to go the other way, to use results from numerical analysis to deduce um, theorems and probability. And just before I get to that, I want to say, well, actually, a while before I get to that, I want to say um, that, um, so uh, later, what we're going to see is a similar result, um, but with a sort of weaker form of convergence, so with an L1 convergence, so that is to say here, we, this is what, what we have here is sort of an L infinity convergence. Um, uh, what we're going to get later looks like this. So we'll have some approximation um, and we'll learn that the, um, th that approximation uh, is a good approximation if we integrate against, um, if, if we integrate over complex. So this is, uh, uh, so uniformly on space-time compacts, um, and uh, the point is that this is um, this is uh, genuinely weaker. In particular, from a probabilistic perspective, uh, you know, this local central limit theorem is telling us about something that happens at fixed time. So that's a sort of one-dimensional slice of this space-time um, field of values. Uh, whereas um, uh, such information can't really be retrieved from a two-dimensional integral a priori. So there's sort of some, some additional work that would be required. Okay, the other thing to say is that this is sort of important that this is the open inter interval here because that direct delta at zero genuinely is messing things up in, in some way if you try to um, control the error right down at zero. Okay, so um, the rest of the talk will be about um, sort of going the other way, but before um, I launch into parts two, three, and four, can I take questions on, um, on what we've had so far? If there are so no questions. If anybody has any yes. questions, perhaps you can uh, write them in the chat box and I will try and relay them to Luigi. I'll just wait 30 seconds. Okay, so um, I'm pleased. Uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll take it as a good sign that there are no questions up to now. Um, the next uh, sort of bit of setup uh, for what's to come uh, is to think about, um, so I want to think about um, this Gaussian density as the solution to a recursive distributional equation. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, the Gaussian density is unique among, um, uh, or let me say the Gaussian law is unique among um, the laws of random variables with, uh, which are centered with finite variance that has the following property. So if I take, um, so the property is encapsulated in this distributional identity. So what this means is that if I take two independent copies of, uh, uh, of the same random variable, so that's x0 and x1, I sum them and divide by root two, uh, then what I get back is that uh, has the same distribution as what I started with. Um, uh, Right, so we know that the um, solution is given by Gaussians simply because um, if you sum uh, centered Gaussians, then the the variance behaves additively, right? And um, and so scaling down by root two um, divides the um, the variance by two. Okay, um, so that so this this is um, this is the sort of generic form of a recur recursive distributional equation. It says um, you take a bunch of independent copies of the random variable, you combine them in some way, the output has the same law as the input. 
Okay, it's probably the simplest example. Um, and it's a fixed point equation for the law of x. Okay, so from this perspective of recursive distributional equations, the central limit theorem uh, says that this uh, a, a fixed point equation has um, a contractive property. Right, so this is some sort of at attractive fixed point. Um, so, um, you know, to maybe belabor the point a bit, if I take some initial probability distribution, uh, mu naught, and then um, some random variable with the law, with that law, I can, um, I can just sequentially um, try, imagine, you know, sort of plugging in copies of Z into this equation and seeing what happens. So let's inductively, uh, so I'll let Zn plus one be Zn plus Zn prime over root two, where Zn, so Zn and Zn prime are independent uh, with the law mu n, okay? And then I'll uh, define a new law mu n plus one to be the uh, law of, uh, of the output random variable Zn plus one, right? Um, so then the, uh, the, cent the central limit theorem says in, in um, or implies, I guess, um, that, uh, that Zn uh, maybe I should say mu n converges weakly to the normal zero one law as long as uh, that initial random variable uh, was centered with variance one. Okay, so that's uh, that's the contractive property <clears throat> I'm talking about, and. Um, So I want to um, think of this, um, this recursive construction where you take some law as an input and then iteratively feed it into a recursive distributional equation as um, indexed by a binary tree. That's what's gonna be important uh, for what comes next. So such a, um, a recursive function, we can see it as, um, indexed by the nodes, um, rather by a, a binary tree Tn depth n, right? And so the the um, the idea here is so we've got height n uh, two to the n inputs at the leaves. and uh, then some output at the root. And the idea is that in an internal node, at any internal node, you think of um, the node receiving inputs from its children and feeding an output to the parent, right? And the combination rule we just described sends a, b to a plus b over square root of two, okay? And so, um, if you like, if these inputs, if this was some input vector x indexed by the leaves of the tree, right, then the whole tree can be seen as computing a function of those, of that um, set of input vectors. And this, in this setting is our, is the, is the Zn that we were describing, if you like, or it has the distribution of the Zn we were describing recursively above. Okay. Any questions about that? I'm now going to apply that same sort of recursive construction, but with a, um, a more complicated functions on the um, nodes of the tree, in essence. Great.
Okay, so um, uh, I guess this is part three. So I like the I like the name of this object. I didn't choose it, um, but I like it. I've said this in previous talks, but um, I'm going to continue to say it. Some names are very uh, descriptive. Uh, they tell you exactly what the object under consideration is, but they don't give credit to the creator. And some names, like Borel sets, tell you who invented them, or hopefully tell you who invented them, but uh, don't tell you anything about what they are. Um, P Mantle's min plus binary tree gives a pretty good idea of the answer to both of those questions. Um, the only difference I really want to highlight, so the, the, the name, the name is, tells much of the story, but not all of the story. The key point here is that whereas above, in this setting, the, the, um, the inputs were random, but the combination was always perfectly deterministic. Okay. In the min plus binary tree, the combination rule itself is random. Okay, so we're going to have, um, you know, inputs A and B and some output, um, which is F of A, B. And so that, that combination function now is both random and depends on the node. So, um, so we'll have F of A, B is, um, so what's the function? It's, uh, so we're going to send the inputs to their sum with some probability p, and we're going to send, uh, we're going to output the minimum of a and b with the complementary probability. Okay, so, um, so with this combination rule, uh, there is some tension between the two possibilities. The sum, if the, so we're going we'll, we'll be focusing our attention on all non-negative uh, inputs. I'd say that at the outset. Um, um, so the sum will tend to increase the value. The minimum will tend to decrease the value. Um, and uh, so let me write um, TN one, so for the output on all ones input. Okay, and so this is another, once the, once the combination rules are, are random, uh, the uh, understanding the behavior of this random variable, random function Tn is interesting even on deterministic inputs. Okay, and um, so there's a phase transition uh, that occurs when P is bigger than a half, uh, the tendency is to combine by summing and given that there are two to the n total inputs, sort of not too surprising that this quantity Tn1 will uh, grow exponentially quickly. Okay, on the other hand, when P is less than a half, um, the, um, the output so the minimums sort of um, take charge and uh, this value uh, stays bounded in probability. Okay, neither of those are particularly hard to see. The sort of challenge is to understand what happens when uh, P equals a half. Okay, so uh, Robin P. Mantle conjectured the following so that, and, and by the end of the talk, I hope to give you a, uh, um, some understanding of, of why this is so. So that the value at the root grows stretched exponentially. So um, to see, to understand the behavior of this random output, you should take, a, you should take its log, okay? And then in fact, the right thing to do is divide by a constant n to the half, for some constant um, and uh, um, that you should see convergence to uh, beta to one random variable. Okay. 
So um, none, I, don't th I think it's fair to say that nothing, um, nothing about this statement should seem particularly uh, obvious, aside perhaps from the fact that given that there are exponentially many inputs, you might want to take the log of the output before doing something to it. But why that something should be dividing by root n, or um, you should see convergence to a beta. Um, uh, certainly, they were um, so it, th those were surprising facts to me when I first saw them. Um, a couple of years after Robin conjectured this, uh, it was proved by uh, uh, so. Tuka Alfinger and Dylan Cable. Uh, so they they um, managed to prove Robin's conjecture and identify the constant. So when p is a half, the um, the correct thing to divide by is um, pi squared over three uh, times n. And you indeed see convergence to a beta two one. I should say, by the way, so this is the um, this this distribution is the maximum of two uniforms. Uh, so u and u prime are independent uniform zero one random variables. Okay. Um, I'll just um, a very quick aside. Um, I'll say it's open. Um, uh, it's an open question what happens for, uh, say, random inputs. Okay, so their proof is a very careful and clever and delicate induction, um, which requires a base case uh, condition complicated enough that it needs to be verified by computer. Um, so uh, I don't particularly see a uh, route toward proving a sort of um, uh, what I'd call a universality result here. This should, this, I, I hope to convince you that this sort of result should actually be rather stable to perturbations of the input law, um, but we don't know how to prove that. And um, last thing before I go to, um, to our contribution um, is that um, this sort of recursive distributional equation seems to be genuinely more challenging than the sort uh, that the central limit theorem throws at us um, because there's no obvious contraction property. Uh, to this, um, to this combination rule. Okay, so the if you take um, B and B prime and feed them through this random combination where with probability half you take them in and half you take the sum, you don't get a beta back. Okay, so the sort of certainly the most naive thing you might uh, think of is saying that the solution should be some sort of fixed point. It just isn't. And as far as I can tell, there isn't uh, uh, an easy way to view this solution as the fixed point of something. Okay. Um, so any questions about that before I talk about uh, hipster random walk, the thing that uh, gave the talk its name? Okay, so um, So the hipster random walk is another recursive distributional equation, um, which I think of as uh, described by a tree. Um, and it really was, we came up with this model in an attempt to understand what was going on in this theorem. So in a sense, it's a, it's a simpler model with the same phenomenology. And uh, it, being simpler, it also allowed us to then generalize the model in various directions, which I mostly won't have time to uh, talk to you about. Um, uh, so let me tell you what um, what the new um, uh, what the new um, recursive um, description is. So we're going to um, have some. Uh, uh, 
IID inputs at the leaves. So again, this is all happening on a uh, on a binary tree of depth n, and then later we'll let n tend to infinity. Okay, and so for a node v, we let f v, so the combination rule, be uh, given as follows. So, um, so a b is going to go to either um, so a plus dv indicator a equals b with probability a half and b plus dv indicator a equals b with probability a half. Okay, so, um, so what's this saying? It's saying that um, at each node, we've picked a sort of preferred child, okay? And the default, the default behavior, if you, you sort of imagine ignoring this part for a second. The default behavior is to just output the value of your preferred child. Okay, so if your coin comes up um, heads, you're going to output B. If it comes up tails, you're going to output A. But if the two values agree, then you then then you will um, add a random perturbation to that output value. That's given by this DV. Okay. So the picture that I have, um, the, 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 the sort of, the, the place where we got the name for this is um, that we think of, um, so, so one, one of the children is hipper than the other. And, you know, hipsters don't like to be observed uh, liking popular things. So if, if they're in their cafe at position, you know, X, and then they notice their neighbor is in the same cafe, then they will take off. They'll make this random move. Okay, so, um, so, so, um, if, uh, so another particle shows up at the hipster's location. They make a random move. And that's this DV. Uh, 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 sorry, this, this is, so these are, um, my apologies. So for this, for this, um, I need two, uh, these, these IID, um, these DV or IID um, uh, variables at all nodes of the tree. Okay, so um, so if you like, at each, in order to determine this function f v, I need two random variables. One is to decide which of my children is the preferred child, and another is to decide the random displacement that I will output from the co their common value if the two child values happen to agree. Okay. Um, any um, j just to be perfectly um, certain that that's um, uh, uh, that the model makes sense. Here's a sort of quick drawing I didn't figure I'd have time to do on the fly, right? So I'm, I'm thinking here of, um, of taking all input values equal to zero on this tree, and then what happens? So when the two, whenever, the, whenever at a given node, the two children have, a, have the same value, then I'm going to use this random displacement dv uh, to, uh, um, to update that value, right? So um, here are the blues, are the common uh, are the displacements and the um, greens are the input values. So at the root, for example, if somehow this node had ended up um, having sending value minus one and this one as well, sending value minus one, then uh, that common you'd add this displacement plus three to the common value minus one and the output would be two. Okay, and here I've just indicated with red which of the children has been chosen as the hipper one. Okay. Um, so is that, um, is the sort of picture of the dynamics reasonably clear? Okay, so, um, so now I'd like to tell you what we, um, what we uh, can say about it. 
So the behavior of the dynamics, it's sort of unsurprisingly will depend on the nature of the displacements dv, okay? If, in particular, if the displacements are always positive, then these values are only gonna increase. If they're always negative, the values are only gonna decrease. Um, uh, but I mean, it's, it's what I'm saying is, um, I, I think it's fair to say more interesting than that. Um, so, um, so you can really get different phenomenology by varying the behavior of the dv. So, um, so when uh, dv is um, uh, plus minus one, so a fair coin, so, so that the, the displacements are, um, look like symmetric simple random walk, okay, then for any iid uh, inputs at the leaves, the final output value um, on dividing by 36 n to the third converges in distribution to a beta 2, 2 random variable, okay? And when dv is Bernoulli a half, so that is to say, uh, so zero or one each with probability a half. So now we get a dynamics which only increases, right? So you're on the, this hipster, hipster is on a one-way street and if someone else comes into the cafe they're in, then half the time they stay put and half the time they go down the road to the next cafe, always following the direction of traffic. Okay, um, then here again, uh, so for any IID inputs, the output, um, and now we need to divide by um, uh, two n to the half, um, converges in distribution to a, a, a beta two one. Okay, um, so, um, and in fact, if, uh, if here I take uh, the hipsters to be lazier um, and take a parameter P for the probability of movement, then this value becomes a four times one minus P. Okay. So, um, so this second result is the one I'll focus on for the rest of, for the last 10 minutes of the talk. I want to remind you in case this isn't in your mind, which would be perfectly reasonable, of the similarity with this uh, result of uh, Alfinger and Cable. So uh, up to this issue of taking logs, we really see exactly the same uh, sort of uh, scaling behavior and scaling limit from the two problems. Okay, and um, so, um, so, um, I want to explain that. Uh, so, so what's so what's behind the similarity between the um, min plus and the hipster um, recursive equations? Okay. Well, um, let's um, just to give you an intuitive idea of what's going on. Um, let's um, let's compare. Uh, say, um, I want to think of the inputs, the left and right inputs that lead to the um, output in the, uh, in the, um, so this is the min plus tree, right? So we've, we've taken, we, we have these, these outputs that are coming from the level n, n minus one problems. And let's, so let's compare uh, the, the logs of those values, so log L and log R. Okay, we're doing that, th these values are growing at a stretched exponential scale, right? So comparing their logs is, is sort of reasonable, okay? Um, well, if those, um, if those values are roughly equal, the inputs from the leaves, uh, from, the, from the children here, Okay, then, uh, then the sum is 
roughly like twice uh, one of their values. Okay, so I'm, I, I want you to think of um, roughly equal as being equal just for the sake of intuition. I'm, I'm going to imagine that, um, that these values are either, say, um, essentially equal. Question, yes. Yeah, so we've got a question that's come up in the chat, which it might be good to resolve, I think. Sure. Um, so the question is, is the input, input always integer? Um, otherwise, good question. Like yeah. So, um, so uh, yes, thank you. So um, here I should uh, take uh, integer inputs, indeed. It's a good question because, for example, if I'd taken IID Gaussian inputs, uh, then the probability of ties at the internal nodes would always be uh, zero. And so we would never see these random displacements. So it would always just be a choice of a random child. Okay, so you need, um, you need le uh, inputs living on some lattice where ties are possible in order for the hipster dynamics to, um, to be interesting. Um, uh, good. So um, any other questions? Okay, so... Um, so I'm thinking about um, what the, what the min plus dynamics does um, if the input if these input values are roughly equal. Okay. Well, if they're roughly equal, then their sum is uh, roughly twice their common value, and so that means that uh, log of their sum is roughly their common value plus one. That's what log space two, right? And uh, the minimum is roughly like one of their values, and so log of the minimum is roughly just log of that value. Okay, so that's saying when the when the input values are roughly the same, then on a log scale, this choice between min and plus looks actually like keeping this keeping the current value or incrementing by one. Okay, and if on a log scale, um, we see a large difference, okay? Then, uh, well, then that means that before we took logs, one of the values was hugely bigger than the other. One of the input values was um, living on a, different, on a different scale, right? So that in that case, the sum will be dominated by the larger of the two values, okay? And, well, the minimum is just the smaller of the two values. Okay, so what this is saying is that um, when the input values are similar, on a log scale, the min plus tree is roughly taking a random increment, a random walk step, getting larger. And when those values are quite different, then uh, the output value looks roughly like the exactly what the hipster random walk does. When the two values, when the, when the ch child values are different from one another, we just output one of the two values at random. And when they're similar, then we make a random increment. Okay, so um, this is indeed a sort of, um, at, at least if you buy this heuristic, it kind of explains the phenomenological similarity between, uh, between these two theorems. Okay, and so the last thing I'd like to do, I guess, is tell you um, how we get to, um, proving uh, a statement like this, where, where numerical analysis comes in, because that was kind of promised in, uh, in the start of the talk. Okay, so here's the proof idea. Let's work out the recurrence um, for uh, uh, the probability that, so I'm gonna focus on the, um, uh, uh, the case where this is a, a Bernoulli half, so we're always moving uh, in the positive direction, okay? Um, and I'll write P and K for the probability that the output at the root is e equal to K uh, after N steps, okay? So what's, what's, what recurrence can we derive for that? Um, so let's think about this is one copy of the tree TN, this is another copy of the tree TN, and then um, you know they're going to feed in two values, and we'll compute some function here and, and send the output up to level n plus one. Okay, 
well, so Pn plus one K, how can we end up, how can we end up with K as an output here? Right, well, um, we could have, um, we could see a, a value K on the left and some other value on the right. And then if the two values differ, then we uh, um, make a random choice. So let's say we choose the, the left child as the output value. That's one possibility. So K different from K output the left value. Or we could uh, do the sort of symmetric thing, um, see a, something different from K on the left and a K on the right and output the right value, right? Or maybe both of the values are K and then we um, had better have, so then the, the, the output will be um, K plus a random increment and that had better be zero. So that gives us a PN K, PN K, and another a half. Or maybe both the values are K minus one and then the displacement is one. And so that's PN K minus one, PN K minus one times a half. So those are the four ways that you could end up outputting value K at level N plus one. Okay, and if you rearrange this, you get the following, you get PN plus one K minus PN K uh, is minus a half PNK squared minus PNK minus one squared. Okay. And this is just a discretization of Berger's equation, the inviscid Berger's equation, uh, which is uh, UT is minus a half U squared sub X, whoops. Okay, and so we're trying to solve another initial value problem, but not for the heat equation this time, for Berger's equation. Okay, and uh, here's what the solution to that looks like. Okay, the solution is uh, u x t is x over t um, on some interval and zero otherwise. Okay, and um, I should really put an asterisk here because this is not unique and part of the difficulty is dealing with the fact that Berger's equation does not have unique solutions. And moreover, it isn't even a solution in the classical sense because it has discontinuities. But the key point is that this is, um, is the density of a scaled beta to one random variable. Okay. So um, the solution to this PDE really is the distributional limit that we're looking for. Okay. And this fact, plus the fact that our discrete evolution uh, really is um, some uh, something, some sort of numerical approximation of uh, of this PDE allows us to import um, these numerical analysis tools to get at least part way toward um, toward uh, proving the theorem. The remaining work, which I don't really have time to explain, is precisely dealing with this. Um, uh, this fact I mentioned earlier that in fact, what we get from um, the numerical analysis literature is only this sort of L1 type convergence, which isn't enough to directly deduce convergence and distribution um, at fixed times. Um, so there's some coupling arguments that go into um, uh, to the remainder of the proof. Um, and sort of happily, uh, it turns out that those, um, those tools, I'll give you, I'll write down a, just a, a, a reference without telling you anything more about it, but um, those same tools, in fact, 
um, allow us to prove um, both of these theorems. Um, so uh, the, the PDE that's being solved by the, this recurrence where the um, random walk displacements are symmetric is a different PDE. Um, it looks like uh, this, okay? Um, it's a sort of scaled beta 2, 2 density, which is a truncated parabola. Um, but again, there's a PDE that's hiding behind the scenes and that's why we're able to solve it. Okay, so the last um, reference I'll write down is uh, uh, this numerical analysis tool is a result of uh, Evia and Carlson from 2000. And as far as we can tell, we've actually pushed the numerical analysis techniques to their limit. Um, there are the monotonicity conditions that are um, required for the schemes to converge provably in the, at least according to the state of the art of the literature, um, actually don't extend to random walks with step sizes bigger than sort of minus one, zero, and one. So uh, if we can prove more general probability results that actually um, has potential to allow us to um, sort of go the other direction and prove new um, um, theorems in numerical analysis. And I'm already a little over time, so I guess I'll stop there. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Luigi, for a beautiful talk. Um, we have a, question, a few questions that have already come up in the chat, so I'm going to unmute people one by one so that they can ask themselves. Uh, the first Great, couple thanks. from Jean-Christophe Moura. Um, yeah. Jean-Christophe, you're, you're on. Thanks. Uh, do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, thanks a lot for the talk. Uh, I think my, the, the, so I had two questions, but maybe I, I'll start with only one and then I, I'll leave the, for other okay. people. Um, so what, what happens if you try to do the same thing for the, for the max plus uh, model? Well, it, it, so uh, min plus, yes. Um, so the issue is that um, the min plus, you can write down a recurrence for the min plus. Um, and it's, um, it's really non-local. Right, so in the sense that um, understanding the pro ha what are the ways that you could see the output value k? Well, if it's um, if if it was a minimum operation, then the then then the input values could have been k and anything bigger than k. And if it was a sum operation, then the two values could have been any two values smaller than k that add to k. Okay, so from what I found in the numerical analysis literature. Um, almost all of the approximation schemes for which their convergence results involve looking at bounded windows. So the scheme has to only look at kind of um, some finite number often denoted P steps to the left and the right of the output value you're interested in. So this unbounded sort of rank domain of dependence uh, seems to be an issue from that perspective. Um, but that said, in some sense, I think you can view the inductive proof that um, Alfinger and Cable are running um, as quite similar to some of the um, numerical analysis proofs. So they're um, essentially showing that there's that something is contracting, and that something is not um, in the sense of a contractive fixed point like for the Gaussian, um, but rather it's some it's the it's the error between, uh, between this discrete approximation and its continuous counterpart. So you're showing that in some more dynamical sense, there's some, um, some contractive property. And that's, uh, uh, um, that's quite delicate because of this, um, um, if, you, if you want to think of this min plus operation as a numerical approximation of something, it's a really messy kind of approximation. It's not one that a numerical analyst would ever choose. Okay, thanks. Uh, maybe, uh, uh... I'll leave it there. And if, if you want me to ask one more question, you can give me the... I'll come back to you, Jacques, if we have time at the end. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm now going to turn to Nina Gantert. Um, I'm going to unmute you, Nina, if that's okay, and I'll let you ask your own question. Yes. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes. So yes. my question was also about this P Mantles model and this open problem uh, you mentioned mm -hmm. about random input. Is it known what right. happens if one takes periodic input? in P Mantle's model? Um, I don't think so. Um, I guess that would mean something like maybe left children 
start with value one and write children start with value two or something like that. Yeah. Or you fix some bounded depth three. I don't think anyone's looked at that. No, that might be, it might be possible to approach that. I mean, so the, the, the approach there involves somehow checking some inductive hypothesis, which is where, so that the, you, you need the, you need the input values to get close enough to the PDE solution that this contractive property sort of kicks in. And um, so that you can kind of run the approximation and it'll, and it's, and, and, and you know, you're starting close enough that it'll converge. So if, um, if you can guarantee, if you have periodic inputs, I can imagine that by a sort of more um, heavy duty um, computer part of the proof, the part that verifies that the inductive, the base case holds essentially um, works, then you could um, maybe get to a point where you could run the rest of the proof. But yeah, yeah the, the, the sort of, the bigger, the bigger the period, the more work the computer would have to do first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great, great talk. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> and then Luigi, one further question from Vladimir Formichov, who I'm going to unmute now and he can ask it. Great. Thank you. Thank Vladimir. you very much. Yeah. Uh, so uh, what about, um, what about uh, the fact if we replace the indicator uh, that A and B are equal uh, for, with an indicator that they are close in some sense? Uh, can you tell something about this? Um, no, I can't. Um, it's quite natural. I would expect a similar um, yeah. phenomenology. Um, I, it's possible that you could, again, run a version of, uh, of the Alfinger cable proof uh, for that setting, because in some sense, they um, are precisely dealing with this possibility that the values are close in some sense. And the combination in that, I mean, when the values aren't exactly equal, but are similar, then they don't exactly get a sort of step to the right, this doubling or plus one, they get some smeared out version of it. And they do manage to, um, to, um, to say something in that case. Um, what I haven't found is a sort of um, an approach which will tell you something about all such questions at once. Whether, you know, if it's, it, the fact that it may be possible to sort of case by case set up an induction which makes the proof work is, um, uh, I mean, if you can do it, that is interesting. But what I'd really like to see is um, something of the flavor, um, anything in this realm of problems uh, is going to exhibit this ph resulting phenomenology. Um, and I haven't found uh, something other than a kind of case by case analysis to get at that. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to take one final question from Andreas Kiprianu before we stop. Andreas, you're on. Oh, you Maybe should not. be. Hang on a sec. Unmute. There you go. Oh, I can't do that. Andreas, perhaps you can unmute. Yeah, I've just done it. You've yeah, done I've it. Got it yeah. uh, just a quickie and, a, and a, a bit of a step back from the big sure. picture here. Well, to the big picture, rather. Um, Berger's equation. It's kind of an equation for shock waves or, or unstable waves. So you get this wave collapse and mm -hmm. your picture showed this. What, so heuristically speaking, where am I seeing this kind of wave collapse in what you're doing probabilistically? Um, I don't, I'm not sure how to answer that except to say that um, it's somehow related to this fact that I don't see a fixed point interpretation of the um, of the RDE directly when you um, uh, when you plug in the limit into this um, dynamics. There's there's um, you don't you don't get the same output. So this this rescaling you know the rescaling of space that has to happen in order for this flattening. Um, shockwave to uh, to ha to keep having the same shape somehow is inherently a continuous thing. I haven't found a way to think of it in a discrete way directly on the tree um, uh, or in the variables somehow. I don't think I have a better answer to, the, to your question than that, but I, I mean, I'd like to I'd like to get at that. I just don't don't know. Okay. Thanks for the talk.
Thanks. Okay. Um, and then I think maybe just one final question from Martin Bolash, um, who I'm going to unmute and he can ask it. Um, Hi, thanks very much for your talk. So I just want to ask actually John Christoph's question about mm -hmm. when you said that uh, if you feed beta 2, 1 into this elementary operation, you get something mm -hmm. else out of it. But that seems to contradict the limit distribution theorem you stated. It seems to contradict what, sorry? That this is a limit distribution, right? So if you take two subtrees or something with beta 2, 1, that should output the same beta 2, 1 in the limit, shouldn't it? Well, except the two, the, the point is, let's go back to the, to the theorem. Um, the, uh, so the scaling in this theorem, the difference between the scaling um, at, le at step n and at step n plus one is, is only in root n, right? Whereas in the central limit theorem RDE, um, it's a, it's a sort of square root of two to the n, if you like. Okay, so, um, so the picture here is the typical scenario um, when you do this um, combination is that the two values are different coming from the two, uh, from the two uh, children of the root. These a and b are, are most of the time different and you're just outputting one of the two values chosen at random, okay? And then there's this very occasional time when, um, when one of the values, uh, when, when, the, when the two values are equal and an update occurs. So um, I really think the reason that there's no contra, I mean, that, that's, the, that's the picture I have in my mind, but I think the real reason that there's no contradiction with the statement that, that the beta 2, 1 is a, is a distribution limit is that the scaling isn't going down by a factor two or root two or anything. It's just going down by a factor that's getting smaller and smaller as time goes on. I see. Okay. Thank you very much.